Ladies and gentlemen, ready for the third part of our four parts disaster scenario training. We have seen why we need to train, we've seen what we need to train. Now the idea is to look at who needs to train and to be trained and when it is necessary to train. Okay, who needs to train? And this question actually has two aspects. What is your training audience? So who are the people that you want to actually train? And uh, who, with whom do you want to train? So there is two aspects. Who are the people that you want to train and who is necessary to actually make your training more effective to reach better results? We look at internal and external resources. Definitely, we're looking at the internal resources among the most important people, we have your emergency team. Those people who will intervene in case of emergencies and of disasters. Uh, led by a coordinator and at least one deputy, those are the figures who actually are managing the overall situation. They are the key point, the focal point among the whole uh, situation, the whole emergency response and disaster response is uh, gravitating. That means also during your training, they need also to be the focus. So the ones giving the guidance directions and they are the focus point, focal point. We have the curator, so the person who knows most about the collection or the exhibition that can also be temporary. Uh, those are the people that you need to involve to understand what your priorities are. Uh, that no curator is going to tell you that uh, they want to leave pieces behind, but sometimes there absolutely is no possibility to save the whole collection. If you have only three minutes, what are the most important pieces that actually need to be taken out of my museum to actually save them? Then we have the conservator, people who have this extensive uh, ability in, in handling, in packing, in restoring the pieces they know, and they can teach also others. Uh, for example, they can supervise. If you have a packing station uh, inside a museum, they can supervise those volunteers who have had minimum training, and they make sure that they are not causing more damage to the, to the collection than is absolutely necessary, hopefully none. Then, if you continue in internal resources, there are system technicians and building managers. The people who actually know our structure, they know the infrastructure, they know where the cables are, where the engines are, how the elevator is working, where the power is, uh, what sort of uh, fire uh, extinguishing possibilities we have, what other measures actually can be taken, how the alarm system work, all of this, all of these systems, the IT part, you know, uh, how is uh, the um, IT system, are the IT systems of the institution being fed? How are they defended against? Other internal resources, for example, are the documentation manager. Whatever happens during an emergency, during disaster response, needs to be documented, and you need to do it with different media. Again, by dedicated or acquired dedicated uh, camera. Uh, digital camera, uh, um, video recorder. Uh, don't forget to also always have a, a physical part. So your your templates that you're filling in, actually signing who was transporting which piece that was packed where and where it is going at what times have they passed. An important point amongst the internal resources are the volunteers, and they put them within the internal resources because they should be they should be feeling as part of the institution if they really have this positive attitude and sometimes when they start that it's the only thing they have they want to be helpful but they don't have the knowledge they do not have the skills now it's up to you to actually include them giving them information presenting them the people emergency coordinator and your conservators that can give them this, this minimum information they need to actually address the challenging situations and also developing the skills, you know, learning how to pack an object, uh, what kind of material it is better, better to use, what materials can absolutely not be used because it is actually damaging our, our items. Uh, 
And if you look at the internal resources, there is many more. Uh, definitely public information and media manager, whatever happens, as serious case, emergency and disaster, but also as a training, I always uh, suggest to get the information out because this helps spreading the, the idea, creating awareness, maybe finding new volunteers. Uh, the security stuff, absolutely important, you know. Uh, how is the, the collection or are those pieces kept secure normally? How would you do that in case of emergency? What kind of possibilities do, do you have? Owners need to be brought on board because they probably need to pay for it. Directors and deputies, they need to be convinced that this disaster scenario training is helping to improve the efficiency and maybe sometimes even save money for the institution. Now look at some external resources. And we start from the very top. We are speaking of governmental organization, maybe the Minister of Culture. Do they issue guidelines? Do they have directives that you must follow? Do they issue uh, products that you can help? Are they offering training programs? Is there a possibility to actually sign up for those, participate, in order to be able to better respond to those situations? Then. Among the external resources, definitely, absolutely key, the civil protection. Here we have images of the uh, earthquake in central Italy, and they have those extensive uh, means to actually intervene. Obviously, the first priority is to save life and limb, but sometimes they can intervene also to uh, save cultural property. Do they know how to do it? Well, it's up to you to get in touch and actually get this, this relationship going. You help them help you. You give the information how to best save the cultural property. They will be mostly glad to actually hear how to do that. I've always found these people very, very uh, helpful and eager to participate. Absolute important fire department. Wherever you are, those are most cases, the first responders in case of serious emergencies and in case of disasters. And when they have a lot of means, sometimes they even take over this coordination or this connection uh, um, function with dedicated means like the ones that you see here. They have all this possibility to use all sorts of different uh, communication means to circulate information. They are gathering it, it uh, helps the decision-making process. How do you fit in this uh, sort of uh, institution, this sort of uh, establishment? What kind of information can you give them and what can you ask from them? One category that is often overlooked, it is the military. And it is really a pity because actually, I've, in my experience, some military forces have excellent capabilities, so ability, and also excellent numbers, resources to actually intervene to save cultural property. They have great means in the sense of logistics, you know, transport possibilities. Um, in uh, or different uh, kind of uh, environments. You know? They can move with four by fours, they have heavy equipment, they can move with boats. They have a lot of personnel. And sometimes if it is a disaster, they obviously will be first focus on saving life and limb, but they may, might have actually the possibility to help you out in saving the, your cultural property, your collection as well, obviously, if you invited them uh, before, if you made that connection, if you have that, that personal relation going on, it's going to be much easier. And basic function of the military is also to provide security. In many nations, they can support the police forces, sometimes with the supervision of the latter, but they can provide some sort of security. Worst case, uh, you can you, you might use or think of using barracks to actually store your cultural property temporarily because security there is actually ensured. There is law enforcement that can support you. And very often I've seen that that aspect of security is overlooked. The police forces are not involved in, in the training. They are not involved. But 
in case of disaster, they will be present. They are present uh, every day, actually, when they're doing your duties. Some police forces, like the Carabinieri Unit for uh, uh, the Protection of Cultural Heritage, they are specifically trained to actually uh, protect cultural property. And we see them here in one intervention after the earthquake in Croatia. So they can be even expeditionary, they can be deployed outside their own nation to actually help. And they have very specific knowledge. Obviously, also for them, the security aspect is most important, an aspect that is often forgotten. But that also involves the local law enforcement, you know, the, the people who provide security, a safe and secure environment in your in your uh, neighborhood. Why not invite them to the museum? Understand what kind of problems there are in your in your area, what kind of uh, crimes are committed in your area. Another external resource I really like to point out is the media. They are definitely grateful if you invite them during your training, during your uh, your activities, because they can sell their product. On the other hand, on the other hand, they're also selling your product, which is the information about your your museum, about the fact that you are being proactive in trying to save it, also by providing disaster scenario training. Academia, there is universities who, have, uh, who offer a uh, um, host of different products that can help you improve your knowledge, your skills, and uh, to actually save cultural property. There is intergovernmental organization like uh, ICROM that has manuals, there's an online site. You will find some links in the, in the presentation. Uh, go to those websites, they are very, very interesting. Uh, a great online tool I always like to, to use is Sicherheits Leitfaden Kulturgut, developed in Germany. Very, very simple, but it gives you a very structured approach, easy to follow, especially if you have no knowledge. That's a great tool to actually start with, and it's available in German and also in English. Then there is non-governmental organization like SOS Archivi, who is, was specialized in actually saving archives and now is developing or expanding their, their scope also to other sorts of structures. Among the external resources, I mean, there are so many, but you can look at fire prevention uh, companies or services. They can help you actually uh, avoiding that cases or emergencies develop. A pest specialist is one of those uh, uh, critters should actually uh, attack your collection. And among others, there is sponsors and donors, absolutely regional and local government. Okay, the mayor, the municipality get them involved. They might be very happy to actually be seen in public and uh, uh, promoting your, your, your messaging, your narrative. Logistics specialists, dry freeze companies or art transport companies, Backing the heritage sector, other museum, archives, and libraries that would like to actually start to interact with you in actually conducting their own trainings. Insurance companies, if you conduct your trainings, if you develop your plans, is it possible to actually get to pay a smaller ins insurance premium? Can you finance part of your trainings through the money that you're saving through insurances? What are some principles? Network, network, network. You cannot do it alone. You need to actually find others. And you see there is a host that this is just some of the most important partners that you need to interact with. Be inclusive when you create your, uh, your trainings. Try to get a diversified uh, um, um, participation in your activities because, you know, it's, it's, the activities are very complex. You need a lot of expertise. On the other hand, be selective. Don't allow anyone to, or everyone to participate. It is good to have volunteers, but also they need to be able to, to give a proper product. When, when should you train? Well, absolutely always. If you're not doing stuff, then you should be training. Some consideration about time and training before the emergency happens. Think of scheduled and unscheduled things, drills, ample warning or short notice. There is no better time to train than right now. Use it and practice. Use the possibility that you have to actually practice whenever you can. Thank you very much.